All right. Hello, everybody. Hello again. Um, I hope you guys had a really good clinical rotation. Did everybody have uh, anything interesting in your clinical rotation you might want to share? If not, we can talk about that tomorrow. Um, last week, I sent you a whole bunch of information. Uh, as you can see, we're going to be covering almost 200 organisms. Uh, not only bacteria, we're going to cover AFB, which is still kind of bacteria, but it's just acid fast, different characteristic. Uh, we're going to cover mycology, the funguses and the yeast. And um, the last section, which is the, a pretty big section, is parasitology. And um, parasitology is, is the biggest section, and um, we'll get through it, like I said. Um, a lot of comments from previous classes, even before I taught this class, microbiology is, um, has a lot, a ton of information that's given out. So uh, compared to hematology, uh, microbiology is much more, um, a lot more information, but we'll get through it together. So let's see. So what I did was I gave you an instrument list of what we're gonna cover and in each of the topics, like for example, so that way you guys, you guys won't be confused. So the first two lectures are <clears throat> safety one and safety two. This is really important. I know you've had safety, and uh, QA and um, uh, a lot, you know, QC and infection and precautions in the laboratory, but these two areas are really, 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 really important. So uh, this is today and then tomorrow I'll be doing safety uh, lecture number two. And then on Friday, and then I'm going to start getting into the microcaceae, and that includes microcaucus and the staffs, and I'll I'll teach you how to distinguish between the four. And then after that, the following Wednesday, um, it's going to be, it's starting to get more in depth with the streps. Uh, strep group A, which is pyogenes, strep A galactis, strep pneumo, viridan strep, and the group D enterococcus and group D non enterococcus. So you have a table and that'll help you distinguish between uh, these strep groups, um, I know a lot of times I'll say it's it should be easy to do. I don't uh, I don't know what your level of knowledge in in these organisms are, but um, I'll help you distinguish between uh, these six organisms. And then the next one, the next section is the Enterobacteriaceae, Enterobacteria. This is a much larger group where. These are all your gram negatives, everything that, that can be found in your gut. Uh, Proteus vulgaris, Proteus mirabilis. I hope these names are not, um, are not unfamiliar. I hope you've heard these names before. Uh, Salmonella, as you know, is, is, is a pathogenic. It's reportable to public health. Uh, so is the Shigella. We're going to go over those, uh, especially biochemical distinctions between these organisms. <laughs> I'll be giving you flow charts between the four Ewing groups. And then you've heard of um, the pathogenic E. coli. There's, um, there's five of them here. And it's not only you hear in the news that there's a pathogenic E. coli that's been toxic in uh, like in Jack in a Box or in some restaurant where it caused food poisoning and the culprit was, was E. coli 0157. You always hear about E. coli 0157. That's the enterohemorrhagic E. coli. So these are the five classes. Uh, ET is enterotoxigenic. Um, <clears throat> um, EI is enteroinvasive, enterohemorrhagic, like I just mentioned, uh, enteroaggregative, and enteropathogenic E. coli. So it's not only E. coli or 157. These, there's like five different ones. Shigella, as opposed to Salmonella, when you do a stool culture, the two main pathogens that you look for in stool, your objective when you run on, you're on the school, stool bench is to identify Salmonella or Shigella. 
And there are other pathogens there too, like Yersinia, Yersinia pestis, Yersinia intercolitica. That's not very common, but the Salmonellas and the Shigillas are more, uh, more common and more pathogenic, and they're also reportable to public health. I'll tell you how to distinguish between the four pathogenic E. coli. So there's a, an acronym that I'll, I'll teach you. Yersinia pestis, that's the one that causes the plague, more Yersinia. Uh, Klebnumo. Klebnumo is really important in babies, especially in urine, if it's greater than 100,000. So one of the things that I want to do <clears throat> this semester with you guys, as opposed to what I've been doing with uh, other classes, um, is I want to teach you guys how to read cultures. Okay, so because when you work in a microbiology laboratory, you will be assigned to different benches. You can be assigned to the respiratory bench. You can be assigned to the um, urine bench. You can be assigned to the miscellaneous or wounds bench, or you can be assigned to the blood culture bench. And then um, one thing I like about microbiology is if you're assigned benches like that, you can go, you can read cultures. If you know and you're familiar with what the plates look like, what's clinically significant and what's not clinically significant, then you, you'll get an appreciation. And, and um, like I said, any specimen that you come, that comes into the microbiology laboratory is basically an unknown. So the doctor orders a culture for a reason, um, mainly because the patient's sick and he wants to find out what's causing his sickness, what is illness, what's making him not feel good. That's where you come in as a microbiologist. So it's kind of exciting. I'll show you how to um, detect from a respiratory culture if you have Haemophilus influenza. And there's uh, later on, um, you know, that's, that's in a different lecture. But I'll, one of the things, like I said, is I want to teach you guys how to read cultures. So when you get into the microbiology, you're not going to only do catalase tests or indole tests or gram stain, gram stain, gram stain, gram stain, instead of gram stain. Those are all elementary. Those are all baseline given tests that every microbiology should microbiologist should know. So this semester, like I said, I want to take it up to um, a higher level, level where you're going to get plates in front of you. As they are submitted to you in the microbiology laboratory, um, you're going to say, okay, what's going on? And is it junk or do I do a workup? Is it junk or do I do a workup? So I'll show you how to identify whether or not um, a culture is junk because, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, skin flora where it's not acceptable and pure cultures. I can, I can show you uh, what a pure, uh, a good workup cultures looks like. Um, Klebs, uh, Kleb pneumo versus Kleb oxytoca. The, uh, the difference is Kleb oxytoca is indole positive. You, you'll know that. Enterobacter orogenes, also part of the Ewing group. We're going to get into Ewing, the Ewing groups, the four Ewing groups, and you'll be memorizing those, and I'll send you the flow charts, and you'll be tested on those. Serratia marcescens in the Enterobacteriaceae is the only one that's pigmented. Hafnia is not really common, but uh, it's in one of the groups. And then moving on to the facultative anaerobes, you know, we'll be talking about Vibrio, Vibrio cholera. Okay, Vibrio parahemolyticus. These are uh, important pathogens that you need to know how to work up. Aromonas, uh, a trick on Aromonas. This organism likes ampicillin. Aromonas A, ampicillin A. So one of the things that Aromonas likes as, as part of the, a culture workup is it tolerates ampicillin very well. Aromonas likes ampicillin, so A goes with A. So that's the first trick I'm telling you. Plesiomonas shigalloides is found in reptiles. Pastorella multicida. Does anybody know about Pastorella multicida? What, what causes that uh, or uh, disease? It's a common disease, so you'll never forget this. Pastorella multicida causes cat scratch fever. Okay, cat scratch. So 
one of the things to be cautious about when having cats, cats uh, is important in, in other, another organism as well, but for cat scratches, which they are, they are known to do, scratching people, you need to be aware that uh, it causes cat scratch fever. Gardnerella vaginalis, you should know what Gardnerella vag how to identify the presence of Gardnerella vaginalis. Does anybody know um, what you would see in your analysis? Clue cells. Clue cells is right. Yeah. So the difference between, and these are, when you look at a urine sediment, um, one of the things you look for is that you look at the epithelial cells. If the epithelial cells look rough and gritty, it's rough and gritty because the Gardnerella has obliterated that epithelial cell. So that's how you know. And also too, it has a characteristic odor, but we can get into that when we get into this lecture. And then there's a facultative GNR number two. Campylobacter jejuni, Campylobacter species has uh, distinctive morphology. It's called gram-negative seagulls. They look like seagulls. And I'll show you that. Um, I can draw it uh, for you tomorrow in the lab. Uh, Haemophilus. Uh, we're going to get into the X and V factors. Uh, X requirement and V requirement. X is hemen and V is NAD. So hopefully in the laboratory, we'll get the X and V discs in. And um, depending on uh, the growth patterns around these discs, we can tell which organism is influenza, Egyptius, parainfluenza, Ducray, uh, Propolis. Uh, H. pylori is also in this group. Um, H. pylori is, in, is important because especially if you wanna rule out peptic ulcer. So what'll happen is if a patient has, uh, a doctor wants to rule out peptic ulcer and he's in the surgery, in uh, patients in surgery, he'll take a specimen from uh, the duodenum, okay, the duodenum part of the stomach and send it to the laboratory. And then we do one quick test and it's called the ure urease test. So you'll learn that H. pylori, um, we wanna find out if it's there, you do a urea test and you'll know in, in a couple hours. So that's a neat thing. And this is, that's where the uh, OR comes into the laboratory. I have a rule out H. pylori. You're not gonna say, wow, how am I gonna do that? Okay, so the first thing you'll do is you'll, do, you'll get your urea reagents out and um, do a urease test. If it's urease positive, then it's a pretty good indication that H. pylori is there. Pseudomonas, um, aeruginosa, fluorescent, um, this organism, stenotropomonas maltophilia, I know that's a mouthful, that used to be pseudomonas maltophilia. Okay, but now they call, I don't know why they changed it, but it's stenotrophomonas multifilia. I'll talk about those. These are, um, now we're into the aerobic GNRs, okay? Um, you'll need to know that uh, Enterobacteriaceae has specific characteristics. They reduce nitrate to nitrite. They ferment glucose. They could either be lactose positive or lactose negative, and, and I'll show you that that's, that's important too. Um, and they're facultative anaerobes, the Enterobacteriaceae. On the other hand, the aerobic GNRs, these are oxidative organisms. They don't ferment glucose, okay? They don't ferment glucose and they have motility if they're motile, um, they have polar flagella, okay? As opposed to Enterobacteriaceae, they have peritrichus. Does anybody know, know what peritrichus means? Peritrichus means that the flagella are, are all over its body, okay? So all over its body, so that's peritrichus. Peri means around, as opposed to polar, it's on one end of the bacteria. Okay, so anything that's mon monus or a monad is one, it could be oxidase positive, and two, it's mot motility by po polar flagella. So that's, that's what you need to know about these aerobic GNRs. Morexella, uh, Morexella, Acinetobacter, um, Chryseobacterium meningosepticum, al alkalinogenes. These are all, I, I don't want to say weird, but they're, they're, they can be clinically significant. Burkholderius sapatia can cause glanders. Uh, and also to the, the sapatia, the pseudomallei, 
and the malaria, they can be bioterrorist organisms. And then Legionella, uh, if you ever heard of Legionnaires disease, um, that's in this group, aerobic gram-negative rods. It's the one where uh, the American Legion had a convention on uh, a ship and everybody came down with this respiratory uh, infection. They couldn't figure out what it was. It was a really tiny light staining gram-negative rod and it was found in the air conditioning units. So um, air, con air conditioning units in, for Legionella pneumophila. Pneumophila. So there are, in this class, you're gonna, like I said, you're gonna be getting a lot of information um, on, on these organisms and, they're, and it can be unique. Like for example, if I showed you an air conditioner, okay, right away, I, I would like for you to think about, okay, Legionella or another one. Uh, another group descriptive term. And what you need to do is you need to start collecting all these unique terms, like for example, fish scales. If you see fish scales on a blood auger plate, they're shiny, they're gray, and they almost look like fish scales. You need to think about Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I also sent you, uh, similar to what I did in hematology, um, a matching, uh, comprehensive matching. Uh, you might want to start looking at those because I've already um, helped you out in getting you your collection. There's a lot of weird things, railroad tracks, grape-like odor, uh, fish scales, mercury droplets, uh, gram-negative seagulls, okay? So all of those things, there, there are these terms that, they, that uh, they may sound like, wow, these are weird terms, but they actually uh, are associated with certain bacteria. So start looking at that list and see, and look at these uh, weird terms and um, associate these organisms that you see with these, with these sections here, like the enterobacteria, the strep, um, like for example, strep pneumia, pneumo, lancet shape. If you see lancet shape, that's strep pneumonia. Viridans is an alpha strep that's not significant. Group D enero, group D non enero. Uh, the way you distinguish between those two is salt tolerance and um, uh, salt tolerance uh, growth and versus no growth and 6.5% sodium chloride. So there's a lot. And as, like I said, as I go through these lectures and as I lecture, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point it out to you. Okay, this is, what, and, and I did this last year in hematology. Um, okay, make, make sure you know this. And, and I'll say, okay, that's a weird term. You might wanna uh, put this in your collection. And you already have the collection because I gave you the, the mega match comprehensive. So what, all you have to do is pull it out and put it into either the, you know, this section of facultative GNR or even right next to this organism. I mean, right next to the listed organism, like for example, uh, Proteus vulgaris, Proteus morabilis. So these two are, um, tell me a physical characteristics about Proteus. Anybody know about anything about Proteus? Did you guys you, do Proteus in your microbiology class? Proteus is a pain in the butt to deal with, okay? The reason because Proteus is a swarmer. It's a gram-negative rod and terabacteria but it swarms. And the reason why it's a pain in the butt is because if there's another organism in addition to Proteus, it's difficult to go after that organism, but there's methods. Say for example, you have Proteus and Staph aureus. I wanna go after that Staph aureus because I wanna do a sensitivity on it. But you know, if I, if I use my loop, try to get the Staph and streak it out for isolation, guess what? I'm gonna get more Proteus but there is a way to eliminate Proteus contamination. And I'll show that to you. But the difference between the two, Proteus vulgaris and Proteus morabilis is the indole test. Vulgaris is indole positive. So you'll be getting a flow chart of the Enterobacteriaceae, the Ewing uh, flow charts. And you'll see that um, how to distinguish between the different species. Okay, moving along. We're still in bacteria. Spirochetes, the syphilis organisms. These are just um, spirally shaped organisms. 
T pallidum pallidum, that's the one that causes syphilis. And then endomecum pertinu and keratium causes the ospentin bagel. I'll talk, I'll, those are the diseases of the treponemes. And then there's Borrelia uh, recurrentis, which causes relapsing fever. I'll tell you the trick on recurrentis. Recurrentis sounds like recurring. Relapsing fever also, also means, or almost sounds like it means recurring. So recurrentis and relapsing go together. So that cause is recurrentis is causes recurring fever. Burgdorferi, um, you already heard about um, what this organism causes, but not necessarily in depth on the organism. This is the one that causes Lyme disease. Okay, Bur Borrelia burgdorferi is the one that causes Lyme disease. And then we'll go over the go. I'll go over the arthropod vectors. Leptospira interrogans. It's a pretty in, um, important organism, especially if you swim in ponds that has this. Uh, this organism and it affects the brain. So leptospi leptospirosis uh, is a pretty uh, significant organism. Now we're gonna get into the mycobacteria. Mycobacteria are different than the previous organisms that I mentioned with exception of the spirochetes. Um, it's easier to, it's better to identify these spirochetes using dark field microscopy uh, as opposed to the gram scene, it's better to see those. But all the other organisms, the aerobic GNR, Enterobacteria, all of those, uh, you need to, if you want to see the organism, you have to look at it under the gram stain. But the microbacteria, you can't really gram stain um, because it has, uh, their cell wall has a high lipid content. So you have to do a procedure called, called the acid fast stain where, in call, where it uses carbo fusion. There's a cold stain and there's a warm stain. So we're gonna do both stains, the Kenyan and the Zeal Nielsen. It's where you take a flame and um, you heat the slide until you see steam and then, um, and then you rinse it and then you look at under, under the microscope. It's really important to make sure you know that you have um, acid fast bacteria under your slide because especially for uh, tuberculosis, if you uh, identify tuberculosis, as you know, it's pretty contagious. So if it's there and it's easy to identify, if you see anything that's red from the acid fast stain, it's a positive, it's a positive stain. You see red rods, it's, it's positive. So, and usually it's negative. So these are the mycobacterium and they're distinguished between um, on, on their growth patterns, whether it grows, there's slow growers and fast growers. Slow growers is uh, growth after seven days and the fast, uh, fast growers are, or the rapid growers is less than seven days. So there's ways to distinguish between the bacteria. Uh, mycobacteria two, nocardia is, is a organism that's partially acid fast. The gram positive rods, okay, those are all acid fast bacteria and gram negatives that I just mentioned. The gram positive rods, carine diphtheria. A diphtheria used to be a disease that killed a lot of people. Um, and it's pronounced carine bacteria, not corny, okay? So if I hear someone say corny bacteria, you know, I'll roll my eyes and say, okay, that person wasn't listening. It's pronounced carine bacteria. I'm really particular, I don't know if I, if, if you picked that up for me last semester, but I'm really particular about pronunciation. Um, Listeria, Listeria monocytogenes. You've heard about Listeria in the news. That's the one that in dairy products, it can con contaminate dairy products um, like Jalisco cheese or in any kind of cream or dairy products. It can be a pretty significant organism. Erysipelothrix rusiopathy is another important. Lactobacillus is important too. Um, um, probiotics uh, uses lactobacillus. Uh, bacillus sub, sub, subtilis and thracis and cereus. These are bacillus that uh, can be used for bioterrorism. If you autoclave ga uh, glass, glassware, then you use the bacillus sterothermophilus. That's your indicator whether or not your glassware is sterile or not. And then, and then that's it for the bacteria. Uh, next is the mycology, the different types of funguses. Gonna go into the clinically significant Cryptococcus neoformans. Um, I have that, I 
Uh, I ordered it in the laboratory. There's a specific way to identify Cryptococcus neuroformans. It's because it has a large lipid capsule and hopefully we'll be doing an India ink prep where you put some of the organ, um, you, you have a suspension in the organism, you uh, make a, uh, a glass suspend, a wet mount, and then you uh, introduce India ink, uh, a little bit in India ink on one side of the glass, uh, the glass cover slip. And then when you look at it underneath the microscope, if you have cryptococcus there, it looks like headlights because, because of that large capsule. Okay, the large capsule will will be bright, and if you see a lot of these bright uh, lights underneath the, uh, so it's really neat to see. Um, if you see a lot of these uh, bright lights or bright circles, then that's the cryptococcus neoformans, and that's called a positive India ink prep. Okay, Candida albicans is an important yeast, causes thrush. Uh, it's a very common yeast. It's it's reportable and um, uh, it can cause problems. So we'll find uh, ways to identify candida albicans. One of the one of the quick ways is called the germ tube test, and I'll show show you how to do that. Then microsporum odwini, we won't handle that. Odwini, uh, microsporum canis, trichophyton mentagrophytes. These are our dermatophytes. Uh, dermatophytes are um, fungal organisms that uh, um, infect the skin. Like you, if it infects the head, it's tinea. Um, let me see, it's obviously it's not pedis and, or tinea capitum, okay? Tinea capitum, that means it, it, it affects the head. Uh, tinea corporum, it affects the main trunk of your body. Tinea pedis, it's the feet. So these are your dermatophytes. They're, Dermatophytes affect uh, only the skin, the, 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 your, um, your, your outer layer, your skin. It's does, it doesn't get into the deep portion underneath the subcutaneous. Uh, and then you can get into the, okay, these are mostly dermatophytes. But then there's other organisms like histoplasma capsulatum. I don't see that here. Histoplasma capsulatum, I must have overlooked that, but histoplasma uh, capsulatum, uh, coccidioides imidis, uh, blastomyces dermatitidis, those are the ones, uh, sporothrixchenchii, those are your systemic mycosis. Those are the clinically significant mycosis. I'll make sure that they get, they get added onto here because we're going to be, well, there's sporothrixchenchii, coccidioides imidis. It, but I don't see the histoplasma there. Those are, those are your clinically significant um, um, fungi and they're dimorphic, which dimorphic meaning that you have a yeast phase and then you have a uh, mycelial phase. I mean, on culture, they can, get, they can uh, produce the fuzzy fungal cultures or they can produce a yeast form. So there's two types of forms of the organism that exist, the yeast and the fungal form. And then finally, the parasites. So for parasitology on that section, you're not going to have, and there's four sections here, and we're going to go over all of these parasites. But uh, as opposed to the other sections, the um, um, aerobic GNR, et cetera, the mycology, et cetera, the enterobacteria, et cetera, the main thing I'm going to do, um, I'm going to have you do about the parasites is to identify them. Okay. You're going to be getting color plates. I'm going to show this egg and you're going to tell me what it is. And so uh, the parasitology is not going to be, you're not going to get a multiple choice uh, portion of the exam. And uh, it's going to be pretty much identification. Okay. Then, so there's also a mega match too. I think I just sent over, thanks, uh, Saray, for, for correcting. I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I had um, sent the correct, sent the correct um, lecture schedule. So you, you should have gotten the, the lecture laboratory and quiz schedule uh, that I sent. Pardon me? It's still um, a hematology schedule. Are you serious? Because I, yeah, I, 
I, okay, I looked to see what I sent and I opened the attachment and it had, it had microbiology. The it, last one is the master for the micro, but the first two, the lecture and activities are from hematology. Okay, but did you get a microbiology one? Did you get a microbiology? This is the one I should have, you should have gotten. It's called 2022 Lecture Laboratory and Quiz Schedule. And this is the one that I thought that I had sent. Do you, does this look familiar? Does anybody have this? Because I look, I went into my sent file and I opened up the attachment and it showed this, it showed this schedule. You don't, none of you have this, right? Okay, I'll, I'll send it over again. And then I'll ask for confirmation that you received it. Okay, so this is a tentative schedule and it's only tentative because you know, I talked to Daniela early this morning and a lot of media hasn't come in. So it, it kind of looks like you're going to be doing a lot of gram stains and uh, spot testing, catalase tests, uh, maybe OF tests. So all these simple tests that we'll be doing in the laboratory, because once the media comes in, then I can tell you and show you what it's, it's going to be really important to know what the organisms look like on blood, uh, blood CNA and McConkey or blood chocolate and McConkey. Okay, so uh, as soon as I get to the lab tomorrow, then I'll be on, on uh, Daniela to find out when these things will be in. But um, gonna have uh, three lectures a week. Uh, this week will be the two safety lectures and the micrococcus, uh, which includes the micrococcaceae, like micrococcus staph, Aureus, Staph Epi, and Staph, uh, staph uh, Saprophyticus. And so these three lectures, you'll be getting quizzes here the following week, okay? Um, what I wanna do is give the exam the following, but the reason why I didn't give you an exam here is because you still have strep and antibiotic susceptibility testing this week. So I pushed off your exam. And here I have the topics of your exam. Safety, staff, strep, and AST will be the third week. Okay. And then and then it follows after that. You'll have uh, entero one, two, and three, and facultative GNR and one and two. So facultative GNR two will be Wednesday of this week, but then you'll be also having a midterm. On, on Friday. So hopefully that's not gonna to be too, uh, too close. Let me know if, if that's gonna be an issue because then I can push it to Wednesday. But then I still want, um, but pretty much on Fridays, you'll be getting your exams, okay? The exams will be here, you know, designated exam one, and then this will indicate the, the lectures. So this is lecture one through five. This is lecture, uh, 6 through 10, 11 through 12, and, and so on. And then you'll be getting quizzes. The quizzes may co um, correspond or overlap some, some of the material and the enzyme in the uh, exams. So if there is overlapping information, then take that as extra credit, okay? So if you get it right here and you get it right here, then just take it as extra credit or extra points. But pretty much you'll be getting an exam every Friday, okay, the exams will be Friday. Okay, getting into the parasitology, uh, the quizzes stop. And like I said, for, the, for these exams, you're gonna be getting a parasitology matching, you'll be getting parasitology case studies, and then I'm gonna give you the malaria life cycle. I think I gave you the malaria life cycle as one of the handouts uh, uh, last week, and then there's going to be a mega match exam. And I gave you the master mega match. Uh, I'm going to go over that again to make sure. I think uh, I didn't see his the plasma capsulatum on there, but I'll review it. But you'll be getting, if I, if I add organisms to it, then I'll send you an updated one. Okay. And then here, um, so these are biochemicals here um, in April. 
because you'll be you'll be done in first two weeks in May. We're going to start, I'm going to start teaching how to read cultures. So we're going to be doing that here in the lab, here and here. I'm going to try to get some, some cultures. I'll let you know what, what a CSF culture looks like, a urine culture looks like, respiratory culture, uh, and positive blood cultures. A lot of positive cultures that I'm going to, I'm going to try to get um, from one of the laboratories. And then I'm going to share that with you. And, I, and I'm going to say, this is what this looks like. Um, I would work up this colony, this colony, and this colony, or I would say, this is what this looks like, it's junk. So for example, a urine culture, a clean catch urine culture has three or four different morphology, uh, colony morphology types. That's an easy one, that's junk. If you, the rule is, if there are three different morphology types, then there's a lot of, there's a lot of skin contamination there, it's not worth working up. But if it's pure, um, then you do work up, but I'll show that to you once we get into reading cultures. So that's something that's new um, that I want to introduce to you guys because I don't want you to only know how to do a test. You know, I want you to know how to be a bench microbiologist by by reading cultures. Okay, I want you to have that experience. So that way you'll be prepared. You'll be prepared uh, when you go into the microbiology laboratory on what the CLS is. is uh, teaching you because a lot of them it's like you know they'll tell you to do a gram stain do a catalase oh my god catalase okay hydrogen peroxide you know they're they're going to tell you to do all these simple basic tests because you're students but then but then once you show interest in what what the cultures are you know what does it look like then they're going to be they're going to want to uh, teach you more microbiology so that's that's uh what what my goal is this semester in this class, okay? So that was a lot to talk about. Any questions so far? It's a lot of information. Are you, you know, after I sent, <laughs> after I sent all that information to you last, uh, last week, it's like, oh my God, with all the organisms, it's, like I said, it's almost 200, almost 200 organisms. And I think some of them are missing. So it's probably going to be 200. You guys are going to learn about these uh, bacteria, fungus, fungi, and parasites. And you're, you're going to have information overload by the, by the time you um, finish this class. And you know what? You guys will do well because traditionally on the ASCP exam, students from this program, they score the highest points in, in microbiology. So all this information that you're going to be taking in, you're going to be seeing it on your board exam, and then you're going to you're going to be answering those questions. So on average, they um, the average score I believe on the ASCP exam is between 700 and 800 points. So whereas in in other areas, unfortunately, in hematology is you know they score in the 600s and the 500s, 600s, 500s, 400s. But microbiology is typically in the 700 and 800 uh, score group. So, so you'll get a lot uh, out of this class and um, hopefully the information. But, you know, I, like I said, uh, in other classes, they uh, input from the students. It was almost kind of like a complaint that oh, it's way too much information, way too much information. But you know what? They could ask you a lot of this information on your board exam. So take good notes, start a collection. Like I tell all the other classes, start a collection of weird characteristics. Like I said, gram negative seagulls, fish scales, grape-like order, grape appearance, uh, pears and chains, lancet shape, mercury droplets, things like that, okay? Those are, um, let me see, kidney bean shape. That's a com another common one. If you see kidney bean shape, then um, that's a very characteristic of certain, uh, certain organism, kidney bean shape. Okay. So start your collection of weird terms and weird descriptions and media. Okay. Media is another thing on, um, you know, what's the media of choice. Make sure you start collecting media of choice of certain organisms. Let's see. Like I have a matching exam, 
So match the following characteristics with the organisms. And here I got seagulls, grape-like odor, musty odor, whooping cough, okay, uh, is associated with a certain organism. X and feed vector characteristics. Uh, and then vectors like sandfly, body lice, or tick. Make sure that you know what your vectors are, what organism these vectors are associated with. And then the next section is match the following diseases with the organism. So you're going to need to know the diseases as I lecture, um, as I give you your lectures. Like, for example, rice water stool, malta fever, carrion's disease, trench, trench fever, cat scratch fever. I already told you that one. That's pastorella maltoceta. Uh, tularemia, uh, Pontiac fever, swimmer's ear. Okay, these are real terms, and they're unique to certain organisms. Uh, glanders, uh, Brazilian purpuric fever. Okay, so make sure you do a collection of diseases, um, unusual terms as well. And then the third section here is match the following organism uh, appearance. Uh, with the appropriate organism. Okay, school of fish on the gram stain, cut glass, ground glass appearance. So there's cut glass and ground glass, mercury droplets. Um, a one unique characteristic is re it requires a 30 day incubation. 30 day incubation is uh, brucella. Okay, safety pin on the gram stain looks like safety pins, and you already know clue cells. And then the last section on this matching test is. Match the following media with the organism. So TCBS is thiocitrate and bile salt media. The, the color uh, of this organism is yellow on TCBS or green on TCBS. And then there's the gem back. If you see gem back, you're looking for one specific organism and that's the Neisseria gonorrhea, okay? And then BCYE, that's buffered charcoal yeast extract, is specific for uh, going after another certain organism. And there's charcoal-based selective media. And there's glucocysteine blood auger. Okay, that seems like a lot. But like I said, all of these things are in the lecture as um, in my lectures is I highlighted them in red. Like I said, if, if it's red, it's important. It's red for a reason, okay? It's red for a reason, it's, and that reason is you need to know about it. And then I'll make other comments. Make sure you know this, you'll be tested on it. If you hear those words, make sure you know this, you'll be tested on it. Put an asterisk by it. You said it's going to be on a test, okay? So when you do your studying, make sure that's, that's at least a given that you, that you know that piece of information. Okay, so any questions at this point? Okay, if not, then I'm gonna get into this uh, first lecture, laboratory safety. I hope I didn't scare anybody away. I mean, there, as I sent this to you, I said, you know, I'm thinking this is a ton of information. Like I said, um, this microbiology class is, I teach at the CLS level. And when I, took, when I took this class, it was pathogenic bacteriology. It was upper division at San Diego State. This, uh, I mean, you guys are gonna be MLTs, but uh, you're getting CLS, CLS level information. So um, if you get into a CLS program later on down the line and you take microbiology again, you will be very well prepared, very, very well prepared, especially, and also too in hematology, because you know you're, your anemia as well. Anyway, laboratory safety. Okay, final objective. You guys will demonstrate in a, and apply standard precautions. That's the apply to the microbiology laboratory according to OSHA. OSHA is that safety organization, stands for Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Health Administration, okay. Enabling objectives, state the role of OSHA, discuss components of the laboratory safety program. One thing about OSHA, when you hear that OSHA is coming to your laboratory, you wanna be, you wanna be um, on your toes. You wanna be on your toes because if they find a discrepancy, one, one, 
one simple discrepancy is, for example, regular trash. If they find glass, a glass pipette thrown away in regular trash, that's a safety violation. And you know, anybody know, have any idea of how much a safety violation is? How much it costs the organization if you do a safety um, violation like throwing glass or broken glass into regular trash as opposed to a sharps container? Anybody have any, any idea? Somebody take a guess. Like 10,000. That's my guess. <laughs> nope, that's low. <laughs> that's low. That's oh 13,000. 13,000? Okay, this is not prices right. 1301, right? No, not 13,000. Anybody else venture to guess? 20,000. Close. You can go a little high, uh, higher. 30,000. No, that's too high. $25,000. So if you have five hits from an OSHA inspector, you just cost the laboratory, or actually you cost your hospital $100,000. And can you imagine how embarrassed you would be if they found four, four violations? Um, you know, another one is like if your instrument is um, pumping waste, directly into the drain and you uh, they ask you where's the, where does this drain lead to and you say oh i don't know i think it le it drains out into the bay <laughs> guess what wrong answer that's going to be a hit so and that's a major hit too especially with uh with safety in the epa so yeah uh an osha hit will cost the organization twenty five thousand dollars so when you're um it's a good thing you guys are MLTs, but it, it, the, the CLSs are, are probably going to take the brunt of explaining uh, what's what, why you have glass in your regular trash or things like that. Okay, so MLTs can be can be in the background and say, "Oh man, you know, oh well, it sucks to be that person, right?" Um, and then list of required practices: chemical safety, fire safety, electrical safety. Uh, handling of compressed gases. This is not all. I mean, there's other things like uh, uh, safety that uh, training that needs to be done. Like, for example, one of the big things is ergonomic safety. You know, in the laboratory where I worked at is like people were dropping like flies with injuries, like shoulder injuries and wrist injuries and arm injuries and carpal tunnel. They were because they're doing the same thing, repetitive motion. Uh, over and over for 20, 30 years. Well, if you if you can imagine, if you're drawing like 40 to 50 patients a day, every single day, you know, in a whole week, that's five five times that for, or, or think of it as a career. That's a lot of repetitive motion. And it's no wonder that people are, are out on these um, injuries, you know, um, FMLA or they're out because of an injury or they have to have surgery. So there's there's a lot of safety things other than chemical, fire, electrical. There's ergonomic safety. There's even um, uh, stress. Stress can be a safety issue as well, okay? Or um, uh, threat, threat management. If somebody comes into your laboratory saying that I don't like my laboratory result or my doctor just told me I got cancer and guess what I'm not in the mood and I'm carrying a gun you know you need to know how to handle yourself and that's 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 um that's real that can happen where you have an irate patient a really upset patient they even have certain codes hospital have codes like code green or code gray or code black you know if they have a gun so threat management and threat safety has to be something that you need to be prepared for so, and it's real because you're, if you're in a healthcare setting, you know, how do you know that, you know, a lot of times, especially if you draw blood and, uh, you know, we expect to be, we expect to be really cordial and polite to these patients. They say, oh, how are you doing, sir? Or how are you doing, ma'am? I hope you're having a nice day. 
And guess what? You know, they just come from the doctor's office and they told her they got stage four cancer. You think they're going to be in the mood for how you doing? How it's a nice day today or beautiful weather today, right? You think they're going to be in the mood? No, they're going to be in a really, really bad mood. So you're going to you're going to need to know how to deal with um, situations like that. I mean, there's ways to be polite and nice to a patient, but uh, you'll have to learn you you have to learn how to uh, not to overdo it. Okay, a list of safety requirements in the microbiology laboratory, principles of biosafety, requirements of standard precautions. Uh, the biosafe, bio, uh, bio, biosafety laboratories, there's four levels of the BSL, biological safety laboratories. And that's like, you know, you heard in the news, the, the Wuhan laboratory, that's a level four. And then of course, in the microbiology, that's a level one or level two. And then public health would be level three, but uh, the ones that do intense, hardcore research, that's the bio level, bio, biological safety level four laboratory. And the types of BSC, a BS, so the BSL laboratories, there's four classes, four levels, as opposed to BSC. A BSC is a biological safety cabinet. Those are your hoods, okay? So basically the three types of hoods are the two open hoods. I mean, level one and level two are both open hoods uh, and they're low level uh, handling of materials. The level three is actually a glove box and it's, a, it's enclosed where you actually insert your arms into these gloves and uh, manipulate and handle the material underneath the hood. You never touch it, your gloves are actually working on it. So I'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, causative agents of laboratory acquired infections. Um, Laboratory acquired infections is real, okay? Um, you can get sick from it, but you can also die from it, okay? From a laboratory acquired infection. And I experienced this personally because one of my previous supervisors, I, um, she was my supervisor and then I had left, I, I had joined the Navy, but she, she remained as a supervisor until I found out that, that um, she died because of a laboratory and Acquired infection. So what happened was, you know, when, when you're dealing with these bacteria, you, you need to be careful. Okay. So what happened was it was towards the end of the day, a blood culture came in. So, so, and it was like 325 or whatever. It was really close to the end of the day. She was setting up a gram stain on this blood culture bottle and she uh, was doing, um, setting up a gram stain. So in doing so, not underneath the hood, when she went into the bottle, she created an aerosol, okay? And she inhaled the aerosol. And it turned out that that particular blood culture was positive for strep pneumo. And she caught it. She got sick and she never recovered. So that's a laboratory acquired infection. So she, she passed away, unfortunately, because she was a really nice microbiology supervisors. Okay, it's real. So state requirements for shipping biohazardous agents. If you see shipping, the government agency that's in charge of shipping and packaging is DOT, Department of Transportation. Uh, the different levels of laboratory response network. Laboratory response network is the level at which you can handle certain organisms, microbiology organisms, like um, a sentinel, um, sentinel reference, and then laboratory. I'll get into that later on. Um, but it's a different, different uh, level of uh, handling microbiology specimens. OSHA, okay, OSHA was signed uh, by President Nixon in 1970, and it was, it's for work-related work injuries. So I don't know if you've uh, been keeping up with the COVID on the news, but they tried to, they tried to make it seem like if you didn't get your vaccine, then it was going to be an OSHA violation, or if you didn't get your mask or whatever, I think it was the vaccine. If you didn't get your vaccine, OSHA was going to find your organization like Walmart or Sears or whatever. And so that was going to be a severe penalty until it was thrown out the, um, by OSHA. OSHA had no real jurisdiction because COVID is not a work-related injury. You don't get COVID, you go to work and catch COVID, um, you know operating a forklift or, or stocking inventory. That's, you don't get COVID doing that. So the whole issue about OSHA 
was thrown out, and that was that was for COVID. Um, OSHA enforces it, uh, their policies through inspection site visits. Like I said, twenty five thousand dollars for each hit that they find uh, when visiting a laboratory. So, and it's uh, they enforce their policies through inspection site visits. You learn a lot from their visits, training, safety training that's done, call-in centers, and posters. So there's a lot of communication that OSHA puts out um, so that we are well informed. Laboratory safety program, there's chemical safety, fire safety, electrical compressed gas, exposure control. Okay, so like I said, the labor doesn't, laboratory safety does not encompass only these uh, areas. Uh, it, can, it can be more like, especially ergonomic safety. Eye washes, okay, emergency eye wash and shower needs to be within 10 seconds away or 100 or 100 foot of work in work area. Now, I know it's not on this slide, but if you get a splash in your eye, make sure you know this, write this down. If you require uh, using the eye wash station and you got something in your eye, you got a, uh, an eye splash. You rinse your water, um, you rinse your eyes in the eye wash station for 15 minutes, okay? For 15 minutes, not five, not 10, but 15 minutes, not 20, but 15 minutes. You'll be asked that, okay? So when I say things like that, make sure you write it down. Um, fire extinguishers and fire blankets should be readily available, and they also should be checked um, Fire extinguishers are checked monthly. Fire blankets, the reason why they should be checked periodically, at least yearly, is because moths, if you're using a, a wool fire blanket, moths can get to the blanket and eat up your fire blanket. If you have a fire and you open up the, the blanket cabinet, it could be with uh, um, it could have holes all over it. And that would that could be pretty embarrassing. So check the blankets to make sure that they're not moth eaten. Uh, available skill, spill kits, they have expiration dates. You need to make sure that your spill kits are, are current and up to date. Same with first aid supplies. You don't wanna use old band-aids or old um, bacitration that's expired. Make sure that everything uh, is within the expiration date, okay? In the laboratory, you should have two means of exit. For example, if by the entrance there's a fire, you need to be able to escape uh, using the other exit. Fire detection system, like an alarm system with sprinklers. Okay, with regards to um, sprinklers, the, there is uh, in your supply room, um, when you store boxes on shelves, it needs to be 18 inches. I know, again, it's not an it's not on uh, here, but it needs to be 18 inches from the ceiling. And that the reason is because you need to give clearance and uh, have enough space for the sprinklers to uh, sprinkle water. Windows must be closed and sealed, self-closing doors. So when the alarm goes off, uh, the doors are kept open by magnets. If, when the alarm goes off, then the, mag, uh, the magnet holding the door is released and the doors will self-close. Um, also to there's a device you open the door and then it'll close by itself you should not uh you should not remove those i i see some people when they because they like to keep the doors open you one thing is that you shouldn't prop doors open if it's designed to close and two you shouldn't remove that device uh that closes the door that's a, if i'm an inspector and i see that then that would be a hit if i see doors propped open that would be a hit okay it could be an OSHA hit, okay? You're not using the door the way it was designed. Constant temperature in the laboratory between 68 and 72 degrees uh, and humidity between 40 and 60 degrees for, of humidity. And that's actually, um, um, those are the ambient conditions, but it's more for um, the instruments because a large change in temperature or a large change in humidity can affect your instruments and uh, QC. You'll notice that on hot days that your QC will go out of whack. So that's something to be careful about. Negative pressure. Negative pressure means that you have uh, pressure 
within your room, but it's being it, the, the air within your room is being exhausted. It's, it's being exhausted, meaning that it's leaving through a vent rather than air coming into the room. If air is coming into the room, the ventilation, there's more air coming into the room than going out, and that's positive pressure. Negative pressure means you have more air leaving the room than air coming in. That's negative pressure, okay? So negative pressure is air, more air leaving uh, is greater than more air coming in, all right? And positive pressure is more air coming in than uh, the amount of air going out being exhausted. Walls and surfaces must be easily cleaned. The rule for cleaning, if you're using bleach, is to use 10% bleach uh, made fresh daily. I think I'll say that again later in this lecture, but if you're gonna be using bleach, use one part, one part to 10 uh, with water uh, and you make it, it has to be made fresh daily. And the reason is because um, it can deteriorate uh, with time bleach will deteriorate with time. Bench tops and furniture must be impervious to moisture. It shouldn't be able to trap water or any kind of moisture. Containment and risk assessment, okay, principles of biosafety is the objective of any biosafety program is the containment of potentially harmful biological agents. If you're using or handling biological agents and you're underneath the hood, you got to make sure that you're not going to expose it externally. That's why the biological safety, the BSC uh, cabinet, uh, the one with the glove box, you want to keep that organism, that pathogen contained in, inside the hood. But that doesn't mean that uh, on the level one and the level two, that means just because it's open that it can come out and you know, onto the chemistry bench. No, you got to make sure that it's contained. I mean, there's a laminar air airflow on those hoods that'll keep the organism or keep whatever you wanna, wa wanna handle inside the hood. So that's containment. You don't want to expose your coworkers to any kind of pathogens that, uh, by bringing it out. So that's containment and risk assessment. Uh, risk assessment is how dangerous is the situation. So protect laboratory workers, the environment, and the public from exposure to infectious microorganisms. Okay. Process used to identify hazardous characteristics of a known infectious, potentially infectious agent. Laboratory and acquired infection, I talked about that. You don't, you wanna minimize laboratory acquired infections. Be careful, be safe with these organisms and, um, you have to treat them as if they can really, really make you sick. All right. Universal precautions is is having having an um, is um, having the thought that everything that you are handling is infectious and can, can cause harm to you. Like for example. Um, Every specimen that you handle has HIV or has, has Ebola or has COVID, okay? Universal precautions is treating everything as, it is, as if it is very, very infectious, has a, uh, it's a very infectious agent. So every laboratory should have this. And during each inspection, they'll be looking for the policy where it says you should not eat, drink, smoke, apply a cosmetic, Etc. like contact, len contact lenses or contact with the eyes, ears, and mouth. No smoking, no mouth pipetting. You sh those policies should be in effect in the laboratory. Also to limit access to the laboratory. So you can't just have patients willy-nilly walking through your laboratory because it's a shortcut to the parking lot. So you need to limit access to the laboratory. Every time a person who you don't recognize comes into the laboratory, and does not have an ID, you need to challenge them. Uh, Sir, can I help you? Are you lost? Okay, things like that. Limit access to the laboratory. Assume samples are infectious. That's the universal precautions. All samples are infectious. You need to be uh, using your PPE. Uh, if it's, there's a splash uh, hazard, make sure you wear your goggles or face shields, uh, lab coats and gloves. Okay, wash your hands frequently. Sharps protocol, don't throw your sharps into regular trash 
and the sharps container needs to be no more than two thirds uh, full. Okay. Okay, so these specimens, these standard precautions don't apply to the following specimens like stool, nasal secretions, saliva, sputum, sweat, tears, vomit, unless it's gr grossly bloody. So these specific specimens here are not considered biohazardous. I think there's one missing in there, like urine. Urine is not considered biohazardous. You would think so, but it's not. So a stool specimen, nasal, nasal secretion, saliva, sputum, sweat, tears, vomit, unless it's grossly bloody. Because like when you change a diaper, you throw it into a biohazard uh, trash, or when you blow your nose, you throw it into a biohazard uh, container. No, you don't. You throw it into regular trash. So these specimens are not considered biohazardous. And by the way, you will be asked that, okay? I'll give you one of these specimens and you'll tell me if it's biohazardous or not. No sniffing in the microbiology laboratory. Well, I have to confess, I sensed when I, sometimes when, when I was on the bench in microbiology, I didn't sniff but I detected odors that come, come from the cultures, okay? Because E. coli has a particular smell. Staph has a particular smell. Pseudomonas aeruginosa has a nice grape-like odor smell, okay? So I don't sniff, but I can detect, I can detect their, their uh, specific odor. Uh, wash benches uh, before and after use, 10% bleach made fresh daily. Okay, wash your hands often, wear your PPE, lab coats, and gloves. Okay, levels of containment, BSL-1 through BSL-4. So BSL-1 is appropriate for agents that are not known to cause disease. So it's handling uh, microorganisms, but these are safe microorganisms, like your staph strep. And BSL-2 is the same level as well. Uh, appropriate for handling moderate risk agents that cause uh, human disease. So usually the, the biologic, the uh, micro laboratories are usually BSL-1 or BSL-2. BSL-3 is when you're starting to use organisms, like I, I mentioned when I went down the organism list, uh, organisms that are potential bio, bioterrorists, you want to rule them out like uh, Bacillus anthracis or Brucella or the Pseudomallei, etc. Those are bio, bio uh, safety laboratory three level that um, you should be, your laboratory should be uh, at that level of containment. And then finally, BSL-4, that's like the Wuhan laboratory where you're dealing with um, the, the coronavirus or if you're dealing with Ebola virus or if you're doing research on HIV, uh, things like that. Those are the research laboratories, the exotic agents. This is the highest level of containment, okay? Um, you're, you're wearing those uh, spacesuits with the um, um, respirator that with the tank in the back. That's a bio, uh, biological safety laboratory four. Okay, these are, you are dealing with uh, dangerous organisms. Okay, the hoods, biological safety cabinets, uh, AKA hood, okay, so BSC. And it's designed to remove or minimize exposure to hazardous biological materials. And it provides containment. Okay, so that hood, again, is probably negative pressure because there's more air leaving that hood than the amount of air coming in. So negative pressure. So, so as that young lady over there is processing a sample there, there's no air blowing in her direction, but it's being vented out or going through a HEPA filter. So negative pressure, more air goes out uh, than the amount of air coming in. So the biological safety cabinet provides, one of the purpose is to provide containment and also to remove or minimize exposure. So BSL has four levels. The cabinets have three. Class one and two, like I mentioned, are open in the front. So that laboratory there, that lab room, that hood there, because it's open in the front, you see that where she can just access by putting her hands in, that it's, that's the opening. So a one and two are both open in the front, uh, open front, 
one and two. And then um, this is out class one. It's air coming in, it circulates. And this here is your HEPA filter. HEPA is high efficiency particulate um, air purifier, high efficiency particulate air purifier. I think I had, I had some notes here. Okay, I wash, remember 15 minutes and then I wash. HEPA is high efficiency particulate air filter, okay? Uh, this is class one, open here. It's open in the front, level two. Uh, class two is also open in the front here. So um, HEPA filtered air, uh, air um, gets, um, this is a vacuum where it's gonna take the air and, and channel it through these two HEPA filters here. One, the uh, filtered air goes to the outside or two, the air, the air, air can uh, return to the area where you're processing your specimens. So, so this is the direction of the air. It gets, um, it gets sucked down by this vacuum, and then it's uh, pushed into these two HEPA filters. So this is a uh, class two HEPA filter, and then the third one. Um, biological safety camera provides the highest attainment, attainable level of protection. BSC-3 is highest level of containment. So these circles here are, this is basically a glove box. I, um, when I worked with anaerobes, when I worked in one of the laboratories where I worked at, they had an anaerobe glove box and it's pretty neat. Where you, you stick your hand through these circles and, and actually you're, you're entering, uh, your hand enters a glove and this is where you will handle the specimen. So this is used in a biological safety cabinet three. Air, uh, air is circulated, goes through a HEPA filter and exhausted out, okay? So this is the, uh, the BSC level three, it's closed. Okay, common causative agents of LAI, laboratory acquired infection. Brucella, I'll talk about that. Uh, Carini bacteria Bernetti. Oh, I'm sorry, Coxiella Bernetti. Hepatitis B virus, I won't be doing any virology lectures. Salmonella, I'll talk about. Um, Francisella tularensis, uh, MTB, mycobacterium tuberculosis. B dermatitis, I'll talk about that. This Venezuelan equine encephalitis, um, I won't be talking about that. Um, chlamydia cytokai. I won't be talking about chlamydia cytokai too much. Uh, and coccidioides imidis. This is the one that causes valley fever, C. imidis. I'll be talking about that uh, in the mycology section. A modern study, shigellosis, shigella, salmonella, TB, brucellosis, and all of those I'll be talking about with the exception of hepatitis. Okay, shipping. Anytime you see on a test question, shipping or packaging, this is the organization you need to be thinking about. Shipping biohazardous agents. There's specific training requirements that when you ship um, biological or biohazardous agents, there's, cer there's certain training procedures that you need to learn. Packaging and shipping, again, make sure you see these two terms. And the, the policies are defined by the Department of Transportation, okay? CDC, CDC uh, writes regulations for the enfor enforcement of CLIA. And CLIA stands for the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act, okay? Federal regulations, the CDC. You hear about the CDC on the news when, you know, they keep changing their policies on COVID and masking and vaccine and boosters, et cetera. Well, they change their mind a lot. So I don't really have too much respect for the CBC, CDC. I did. I'm, I mean, when you're a microbiologist, your, your dream job, when you're a microbiologist, your dream job is to work for the CDC. But with the way recently how they're doing the policies, I don't want to get political. It's like, it's kind of wishy-washy. FDA, FDA clears products used by the laboratory. So in other words, every test that you perform in the laboratory 
has to be FDA approved, whether it's a glucometer test, whether it is a, a test for AOT, AST, uh, a hematology test, all of those tests, all those instruments inside the laboratory, all the procedures have to be FDA approved. Okay, so, so they govern a lot in the laboratory. They clear the products used by the laboratory in diagnostic testing. Okay, EPA, when you're talking about waste disposal, that's the Environmental Protection Agency. EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency. So they, they want to know where you're disposing your waste. Okay, basically, are you harming the environment? Like I said, the inspector will say, I noticed that uh, your waste is going down is going down the drain and where's that drain lead to? So it better lead to um, uh, an area that's collecting waste that, that'll be treated later on. But if you say it's leading to, it's dump, I'm dumping this waste into the uh, San Diego Bay, that's the wrong answer. EPA will jump all over you. So they wanna know if what you're doing is harming the environment, the Environmental Protection Agency, how you're disposing of toxic waste. OIG is monitoring laboratory for fraud, waste, and abuse. And this is, this is the one where this, is, this organization is the one where your laboratory um, billing practices, like patients come into the laboratory, the laboratory bills them. Okay, so, and then there's, uh, we can get into things, they look for things like Medicare fraud and insurance fraud. So that's what the OIG officer, OIG stands for Office of the Inspector General. OIG stands for the Office of the Inspector General, okay? Okay, the Laboratory Response Network, okay? There's three levels. The lowest level is the Sentinel level. level. And these laboratories have the ability to rule out bioterrorist threat organisms. So it's a low level detection of um, bioterrorist organisms. It's low level, you can detect it if you think it, if you have a suspicion that it may be anthrax or it may be brucella, then you need to forward it on to the next higher level. So the sentinel level is the lowest level, like the hospital laboratory. If you have a suspicious organism, like I think it's uh, anthrax or I think it's brucella, then you send it from sentinel to the reference laboratory. And these laboratories are like the public health laboratory, the state laboratory, okay? And if they do think, or they have a pretty good suspicion that they're confident that it is anthrax or it is brucella um, organism, then they will send it to the national. The reference laboratories, these reference laboratories, especially the, um, the, the reference and the national can use BSL-3, okay? BSL-3 or better, okay? Or it could be a BSL-4. And at the national level, this includes the CDC and the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute uh, of Infectious Diseases, USAMRID, okay, USAMRID, CDC and USAMRID. This is the one where these definitely, that definitely is anthrax, and they're, they're going to investigate where did the anthrax come from, uh, who planted it there, what country, if it's an international issue, the national level of the lab laboratory response network is the highest, okay? And they use BSL level four, like I said, the, the, the jumpsuits with the um, respirator in the back, okay? You see when like people, um, the scientists in the Wuhan laboratory, they're all covered with, they're all in these spacesuits. That's, that laboratory is a BSL level four, okay? And it serves as the final authority and evaluation potential bioterrorist specimens. Reading assignments, uh, throughout the lecture, I tried accessing these hyperlinks and I had trouble. Maybe hopefully if you can get into the, this, uh, those hyperlinks, then maybe you'll be more successful. Uh, some more reading assignments, some sites that you can try to open up for additional information, okay? So that was lesson one. So microbiology fields of study, Okay, the student will list and describe fields of study included in microbiology. Okay, so you got bacteriology. So as I went down the list of organisms that we're going to be uh, learning about this semester, bacteriology, okay, that's one, one field of study. 
And then the next field of study is mycobacteriology. Those are your acid fast bacteria, AFB. Those are your AFBs. And it's acid fast because of the lipid content in the cell wall. You can't gram stain, you can't get good gram stains from AFB, okay? And then mycology, you got your yeast and your fuzzies. Okay, so when I say fuzzy, um, that's why I had this picture here. Does anybody know who this, this gentleman is? Who is this gentleman? Is that anybody? Don't see anything. Say that again. I What's don't see name? anything. One more time. I can't see it. Oh, you can't see it? Okay, let me expand it then. Rudy, you know who this is. I just see a gray background. Are you serious? You can't see him? You can't see you can't see this? You, no, guys, it's a, you cannot it's a, see this. No. Okay. All right. Anyway. Um, anybody know Don King? You know who Don King, King is. Don King. He's a boxing promoter. One of his trademarks is his hair and his hair looks it's like it's it's up and it's fuzzy so whenever i think of fuzzies and in, in my mycology i i think about him i don't mean to be mean or anything that he that he makes me think about funguses but especially the dimorphic fungus you can have the yeast colonies and then you can have the fuzzies <clears throat> okay, and then virology. I'm not going to talk about virology uh, this semester. And then parasitology. Like I said, we're going to go through a bunch of parasites, the protozoa, the nematodes, the roundworms, uh, the flatworms, the cystodes, and the trematodes. And, and that'll be it. Everything below that, the pentastomids, the acanthocephala, arthropods. Arthropod vectors are important in, in parasitology. So we'll talk about uh, arthropod vectors. Uh, third is the microbiology, or lesson three is the microbiology organization, and I'm going to talk about um, the chain of command within the microbiology laboratory. And first you have the centralized facilities, which is located in the laboratory, and then you have uh, the different types of testing. The physician office laboratory, uh, which is a small laboratory, doctor sets up a clinic and he wants to have a little laboratory where you can do, where you can do wave testing. Uh, then you have ancillary outpatient hospital clinics where you don't have any inpatients, but you have outpatient draw stations or you can, which can also have an urgent care. And then you have point of care testing where you can do glucometer testing or strep throat testing, or you can do um, COVID testing. I mean, COVID testing can be a wave test, okay? That's point of care. Uh, based on the following or uh, space requirements and organization, um, um, space requirements and organization, it's based on the organization and staffing. So you, you want to have a large enough space if you if you have a large staff, you know, and you don't want to have a small space with a large number of, of personnel. And that's one of the things that on an inspection they're going to evaluate if if you have enough space. To, to do the testing that you provide. Uh, the test to perform, that's really important. Available equipment. If you have enough equipment to do the testing that you're providing to your patients, you have to have uh, adequate electricity, adequate plumbing. I mean, is do you have sinks in the blood drawing area or adequate sinks in, in the laboratory? Do you have enough 220 outlets as, uh, as needed or 110 outlets? Uh, where you don't have to use extension cords, air handling requirements if you have good ventilation. Uh, safety equipment, that's mandatory. You need to have eye wash stations, you need to have eye showers, and you need to have um, the fire extinguishers. Waste treatment requirements, so make sure that you're not dumping your waste directly into the bay, that the water, um, that the waste uh, from your instruments are, are contained and handled properly and containment requirements. The microbiology should have, in their laboratory, should have an area where you receive and access specimens. Uh, that's true for any laboratory, but you have a receiving area 
an accessioning and processing area. Then after that in microbiology, you need to have staining like microscopy, special microscopy to evaluate specimen acceptability. Sections in the laboratory include waste disposal. So as the CLS is done reading their cultures, they throw their, their junk cultures away into the waste, into their biohazardous waste. Then they, um, they bag it up and that bag, that waste has to be put into a special area for waste disposal. Otherwise the laboratory is gonna smell. Uh, media, media prep and glassware washing could be another area in the laboratory. Isolation room for uh, processing, processing AFBs. Okay, so when you process AFBs, you can actually, that another laboratory acquired infection. Um, the centrifuges that you use to um, process the AFBs has to have, you know, on the buckets, has to have a cap, a screw cap on each of the buckets. And uh, when you centrifuge it, uh, when you turn on the centrifuge, that centrifuge has to be um, inside of kind of like a closet. So the laboratory where I trained, we processed AFBs. We had caps that screwed onto the buckets on the centrifuge. And then once we turned on the centrifuge, then we closed the door. It was like a closet that the centrifuge was in. Uh, for molecular diagnostics, you need to have separate rooms because for PSR, uh, PCR testing, contamination is a big is a big issue. Sections are uh, microbiology laboratory sections. Um, benches are for routine workups. Um, like I said, the blood culture, the routine culture, CSF, blood and uh, urine culture. Those are the different benches that you can be wor you working in. Uh, offices for administrative um, personnel, record storage for your results, a conference room where you have meetings, and a lunch break room. Okay, I'm not going to go over the floor plan. Chain of command starts at the top with a director, a, then a supervisor, then the technologist, which is a CLS, then the MLTs, that would be you, then the lab assistants, those are the ones that will be doing the planting, and administrative support, which is the, the clerk. QA, um, each department or each laboratory, not only for microbiology, should have a QA, a quality assurance section. And that's in microbiology, it's to uh, track unacceptable specimens, uh, contaminated specimens, um, the amount of workload that you do, uh, mislabeled specimen, that's also Q a QA monitor. In fact, um, information technology. Okay, so the laboratory system that you're on in the laboratory, it's called the LIS, the Laboratory Information System, like Cerner. Cerner is an LIS or a Meditech. That's an LIS. It's a laboratory information system. Now that LIS feeds to a larger uh, system and it's called the hospital information system. It's, that's the HIS. And the HIS could be like Epic or Health Connect. Okay, so what that does, it receives information of information from the laboratory about the, your results. So the LIS processes from the instruments into the LIS. That's those are the results. It has the patient's name, medical record number, etc. And then what it does, it sends that information from the LIS to the HIS. And the HIS is what the doctors use. It's what the administration uses. Okay, so that's the bigger picture. It's the HIS. So that's information technology. When you see logistics, all that is a supply chain. Okay, your supply, your inventory, whether you, you use just-in-time inventory, make sure your, in, your inventory does, uh, monitors your expiration dates. And then you have your housekeeping staff. It's really important to have a uh, network with the housekeeping staff because they will make sure that your biological waste does not accumulate because I'll tell you that it really makes your laboratory stink if it accumulates. And that's it for lecture one. Okay, are there any questions? No? No questions. A lot of information, okay? So tomorrow, I'll do uh, lecture two in the laboratory face-to-face and um, this lecture I recorded, but tomorrow's lecture, since I'm face-to-face, -to -face, um, 
it will 